Rope Leader really started, um, I think, last year in the summer of 2000 when uh, Nintendo had its new console almost done and we were getting early prototype hardware. And at that point in time, everybody having worked on, on uh, Battle for Naboo, an episode one game um, for the Nintendo 64, um, here at Factor 5 decided, hey, now is the time to do a follow-up um, to our most successful game up to that date, which was um, Rogue Squadron on the Nintendo 64. And uh, GameCube, um, as the machine wasn't even called at that time, was really perfect for envisioning the Star Wars universe or, or recreating the Star Wars universe, um, especially the classic Star Wars universe, in a way which, which never has been possible before in interactive media. And we set out, we had, we had a 19-day time frame for um, a Japanese trade show called Space World to, to create a teaser version. Um, LucasArts said, yeah, um, you can do it, you've got the hardware, so um, let's give it a try. And Nintendo wanted to present the new hardware there. So um, we brought a fight, first of all, an introduction cutscene, which is on this DVD um, as a teaser trailer, that and a playable uh, version of the uh, Death Star Endurance level, which you can unlock here. We, we brought that together in the 19 days, which was a really stunning proof of concept that you could, on this new machine, GameCube, create games very, very, very quickly with high production values, which was important. And that then basically, over the next half year, while, we're, while we uh, finished uh, Battle for Naboo, led into the real uh, Rogue Leader, which was actually started in February of this year, 2001. Tense moment. One of the main things why we had everything had to work out was basically the time frame. Because usually nowadays huge games like Rogue Leader take 18 to 24 months to produce. And since we wanted to hit launch of the console, we had to get the game done in eight months, which is an insane time frame. But we thought it's possible because we've got a very good core technical team. We knew what GameCube could do. We were one of the first developers in the world to have access to GameCube. And uh, all this, all the support from Nintendo, which was fantastic. I would like to say they are treating me well here. They give me one meal a day. Um, the typical game production for this, which is probably pretty much a prototype for how making a game works, um, started in, um, I guess, late December of 2000, where basically the team sat down, or a, a core team sat down. In this case, the mission designers, myself as the director, um, Brett Toasty, the producer, and then various people who wanted to join. And we sat down and tried to flesh out a design. And at that point, really, the planning with the programming team starts. The software engineers or programmers, as we call them, basically sit together and they try to determine, reading through the design, which different parts of the engine have to be done. And we needed something for the um, so-called tile map levels, which works like a puzzle, which is the Death Star, the second Death Star, and, and parts of Bespin um, and the Imperial Academy. And we needed our, a landscape engine, obviously, for the landscapes. We needed space, which is very easy. You don't even need an engine. You need just a sphere with stars on it. At that point, where, where the programmers were pretty convinced that they could do it, our already had, had started. Our lead artist, Paul Topolis, had basically um, pulled everything out of the archives, which was available. Um, some of that material is usable, some of it isn't. So we had one modeler, for example, starting in ant anticipation of the project last year in summer, building really high polygon, very detailed models um, of all of the Star Wars player craft. Um, and Bastian, um, the, um, the modeler who did that, he was working basically during the whole time just on the player craft. And um, so the art asset generation starts at that point. Paul coordinated um, with the other artists and then we, we divided it up um, into strength. So there are certain people like Bastian who are very good about mechanical structures. So he was perfect for, for those models. Or Mario Wagner, um, our art director here, um, he's also very good at, at mechanical structures and these things. Then we've got other people like Armando Afre or um, Corsa Caratas who are good at organic structures. So we went through the Star Wars universe and said, okay, what's organic? What do we need organic? And assign it to these people. 
a story which went through the um, through the gaming press uh, and the internet, which which was often told, was that um, we got models from ILM, which isn't true because. ILM models usually are done with so-called NURPS, whereas in games we're still working with polygons most of the time, so the NURPS models from ILM wouldn't help us that much because the work to transform them into polygons is quite hefty. The next challenge then, if you're, if you're getting the first art assets um, together and the programmers have created the basis of your engine, at that point, hopefully the mission designers come in. And um, Jamie, Al, Chris and Chris Crawford, our level designers, they basically came in and, and grabbed all the art assets at the time. And then in a proprietary tool, which we have been using for years and have developed here, are basically grabbing all of these assets and placing them and they can transform them into a game with the assets which they get from the programmers. So basically, if you've got a TIE Fighter, they can tell in the tool the TIE Fighter to behave in a certain way. That's in a, in a very crude form the description of how you create a game. We certainly were helped by pretty good tools, which we had. Um, one of the main outside tools we were using was Alias Maya, which is one of the big 3D packages, which, which also movie production companies are using, and which was good for a lot of our art. But we also created a lot of our in-house in -house tools. On the sound side, an interesting development was, for the first time, we could do 5.1 full five-channel sound, which only came into existence um, relatively late in the process when we got into contact with Dolby because we did develop the GameCube music system called Musix and in the end we had to um, we had to convince Dolby that it would be possible with their new Prologic 2 technology to get real five channel sound out of it. So that was one more challenge where in an already tight schedule our programmers had to sit down and really pull it pull it off in the shortest time frame possible. But yeah I think in, in the end um, it, it all came together pretty well.